Hello, friends. Welcome to KGW News at 5 o'clock. You know, it wasn't that long ago when the news was filled with so much frustration from people just trying to get appointments for the coveted COVID vaccine. Well, the tide in that case is really kind of turned around. Now, in some cases, it's a little bit of the opposite. Supply has started to outpace demand. Here's Tim Gordon. COVID vaccine keeps rolling off the production line, but the rush to get it seems over for now in Oregon and Washington. Not that there aren't plenty of people still rolling up their sleeves for a shot. The Oregon Convention Center has been administering 8,000 doses a day or 40,000 a week for several weeks running. But go to the All for Oregon website to book an appointment and it's never been easier, says Brian Terrett of Legacy Health. I mean, it's hard to imagine the demand that we had a couple of months ago uh, versus what we have now. I, I'm not really sure if anybody would have believed that we would get to the point where, where we actually have appointments available for anybody who wants one at this point. The same is true in Washington. The Clark County Event Center keeps vaccinating thousands, but instead of fighting for appointments, it's wide open today, tomorrow, and the next day. So what's going on? Here's Dr. Alan Melnick. We believe there's, uh, there's a large number of people who are not opposed to the vaccine, uh, they're just not as eager to get it as uh, people were, you know, earlier on when the supply was limited. Melnick says things they're doing to make it easier for those people include doing more mobile clinics in different communities, increasing clinic hours, and not requiring appointments at the county's Tower Mall vaccination site. Back in Oregon, OHSU still requires you to make an appointment at its PDX and Hillsborough Stadium clinics, but it is allowing people who got their first dose somewhere else to get their second dose with them. All to entice people to get a vaccine that has been administered more than 8 million times so far in Oregon and Washington. Now, I can't say enough about what the miracle this is to have this vaccine. A vaccine that's been proven safe and highly effective as protection against a deadly disease. Tim Gordon, KGW News. We are still waiting to find out if Washington County will move into extreme risk restrictions. The governor is expected to release an update today, but it appears Washington County could avoid any new restrictions. Any changes would go in effect on Friday. Now, this is where things stand right now. Unlike Multnomah and Clackamas counties, Washington County stayed in higher risk last week, did not move up to that extreme risk. And there is a key metric that might keep Washington County from moving into that extreme risk category. These are the latest hospitalization numbers from the OHA website. And take a look at that number in green. The percent change on hospitalizations week over week is at 14.9%, just below the 15% threshold. When we get official word from the governor, we will definitely let you know. A lot of anxious business owners waiting for that one. Meanwhile, in Washington, Governor Jay Inslee is putting a two-week pause on new restrictions there. Every county will stay in its current, current phase for now. In southwest Washington, Cowlitz County is in phase two. Clark and all other counties in the area are in phase three. Both phase two and three allow for indoor dining with capacity limits. Data from the State Department of Health shows the state's fourth wave is hitting a plateau. Each county will be reevaluated in two weeks. And this just into the newsroom, Oregon State has announced it will require students to get the COVID vaccine before returning to campus this fall. The requirement applies to any student or staff who will be at any of the OSU locations throughout Oregon. This is the first public university in Oregon to make the announcement. The University of Washington and Washington State have both said they will require vaccines. The FDA is likely close to authorizing Pfizer's COVID vaccine for children from 12 to 15 years old. That's according to several media reports, including the New York Times. The article, which cited federal officials familiar with the plan, said the announcement could come at any time. And if it does, the CDC would then hold an emergency meeting and issue recommendations. A recent study showed the two-dose Pfizer vaccine was both safe and effective in children aged 12 to 15. The end of the pandemic won't be a finish line. There will be lasting changes for decades. Galen Etlin spoke with a historian to see what we can expect using perspective from the flu pandemic of 1918. 
Oregon State professor Christopher Nichols is busier than ever. Everybody's been so interested in history. His work researching the flu pandemic of 1918 has a lot of attention during COVID. How can we understand our present moment? How did people grapple with something like this? Both pandemics involved similar prevention tactics. Closure policy, distancing, masks. But without as much health infrastructure and mass communication, people didn't know why so many were dying. People wouldn't help their neighbors in some communities. Um, they, they really got clammed up by fear related to the flu. Misinformation was a problem. Some publications speculating how the virus spread. From the phone? perhaps, so you should stay away from phone calls. But in contrast to now. So in the 1918 and 19, there was, there was no politics, really, of the flu. And it wasn't a deliberate sort of misinformation campaign in the way that we've seen perpetuated in social media. That's really different, really insidious. There's no historical precedent to help us deal with that, except that we need to keep talking about it. So as we gain an edge on COVID, where do we go from here? What is normal after this? And they were struggling with those same questions in 1918 and 19. You can see this in the personal letters and the diaries. For one, health was never the same. The flu pandemic led to variants. That gave rise to the seasonal flu as we now know it. That is almost exactly what's going to happen with COVID. What maybe is different this time around? Uh, the capacity to ramp up vaccines, which we've amazingly done, the fastest in, in world history. The other good news ahead could be renewed joy and appreciation. The 1920s saw a community renaissance of events, sports, arts, and movies. So some things might be reborn out of this that were on the decline. Seems entirely possible, yeah. But history also serves a warning. The 1920s spurred a new era of organized racism and Klan activity. Probably see the same sort of underside, this xenophobia, this alienation, fractured and fragmented politics. The so-called Spanish flu created fear of others, similar to now. Pejoratives that have been expressed ab about uh, this being a China flu. After the 1918 pandemic, some countries reformed universal health systems. The U.S. largely didn't create federal structures to deal with health care or to deal with the next pandemic. So that will be a question for Americans moving forward, along with what changes will you make? Trying to live your life as fully as you can. And you, you have to believe that part of that comes out of the pandemic experience. Galen Etlin, KGW News. Okay, let's talk some baseball. Are you ready for some baseball? The Hillsboro Hops open their season tonight at Ron Tonkin Field. And for now, fans are allowed. Art Edwards joins us live from Hillsboro. Art, this is a really big night for the Hops. Well, it certainly is. You know, the excitement is really starting to build here at Ron Tonkin Field because it's been a long time since the Hops were out here. Fans will be here, some a few, not a lot, but they'll be here and they'll be wearing masks. Different this year because the Hops move up in class. They're a high A class team now, so they're going to play 130 games in the regular season. Uh, we caught up with some of the players, some of the other folks with this team, and uh, one of the players has a connection to the Pacific Northwest. Yeah, it's a good feeling. I mean... Anytime you can be back in the Northwest, um, you know, I grew up in Seattle, so it's basically my backyard. Um, so I was, I was really excited when I found out that I was going back to Hillsboro and, uh, you know, it just brings back a lot of good memories from that 2019 season, uh, finishing up here and uh, with the championship. There will be fans in the stands for tonight's game. They are limited to 15% capacity. That means 800 to 900 fans. We're going to try to make this feel like a normal hops game. I mean, I think, you know, as we look, beyond the last few months and into the last 13 months, people are ready for this. They're ready to come out to a hops game. They're ready to be outdoors. They're ready to be with their friends and family. And we know we can keep people safe in this environment, but we want people to have fun. They deserve it. The Portland Timbers and Thorns will not have fans at their home matches this weekend. Multnomah County is in the extreme risk category, and that limits gatherings. The team had asked the governor for an exemption to allow 15% capacity with no concessions, but that was denied. Oregon State football has had to pull back from its plan to have fans at the team's final scrimmage on Saturday because Benton County is moving into the extreme risk category. And with this bucket, Carmelo Anthony moved into 10th place on the NBA's all-time scoring list. He nailed a three in the second quarter of last night's game against the Atlanta Hawks. I knew this moment. I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I didn't know the other moments. I didn't know the, the, the 15, the 13, the 11, but... You know, 10 is, 10 is something that I knew, um, you know, and I, I felt it. <laughs> Mello passed Elvin Hayes for that 10th spot on the all-time scoring list. Hey, back here uh, talking about the Hops. First pitch is set for 635 against the Aqua Sox here at Ron Tonkin Field. It's going to be really nice to have some live baseball here in our area. 
sure will, Art. Go, Hobbs, and congratulations to Mello, too.